So you were formerly the chairman and CEO of Qualcomm, and just in June you announced your new company, XCOM. Right. So why don't you tell us about business developments at your new company and what you're doing exactly? Yeah, so people thought that we were a 5G company, but really we're 4G to 6G, meaning 4G phones are phones that already exist. You can't really change them much. 5G phones are coming out, and so you can do a little bit of changes. In 6G, it's like any sky's the limit. We can do whatever we want. So we're working on technologies that go all the way from 4G to 6G, beyond what even they're, they're talking about here, trying to make the systems work better, adding some more features to it. And is uh, the focus investing or inventing these technologies? No, our motto of our company is keep inventing. Hashtag keep inventing. And it's basically, I love the saying, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So we're really, it's a bunch of people who were kind of the world's best system engineers in the wireless industry. A bunch of people came out of Qualcomm. People have come from other companies as well. And what we're trying to do is figure out how to push the state of the art. So our, our partners, our customers, have applications that need to do something more than what the systems are able to do right now. And they want to come to us to give them an end-to-end -end design. And it's more than just making the components, like not just, oh, here's a chip, go figure it out yourself. It's really, how does the whole thing work together from the network side to the cloud piece to maybe edge computing where the, you, know, you take out the cloud out of the data center and bring it closer in? Uh, how do the devices work? All of these kinds of things. So a great example is uh, working with Facebook right now, who has a set of applications that they're interested in, which are the demands on the system are beyond the state of the art. And we're doing it in really interesting environments with them. And so they came to us, and we'd worked with them, obviously, in the Qualcomm days as well. And they said, you know, we want to do these new cool things. How do we do that? And they knew that we had the skill sets hmm. to be able to do those kinds of and things. And is this partnership focused on some of their wireless ambitions in developing markets for Facebook? Right. So a lot of it has to do with that. But it's also, it's sort of across the board. Hmm. I mean, they have... They have interests very broadly in wireless. I mean, you remember they were looking at even flying drones to create wireless networks and so forth. Um, and they have a bunch of uh, people. I mean, it's really fantastic the, the kind of resources that they have to put against it. So when they work with us, they get you know, good system engineering resources to complement what they have. And for the fleshed out business model, how exactly does this work? Are you license, licensing uh, proprietary 5G technology, or are you providing specific software and designs for these companies to use? So we're pretty flexible right now. We aren't, because we're small, we can, you know, it's a startup, we can basically do the things that we want. We're funding the company right now doing a lot of NRE projects, meaning that they give us some money and we help build out some capability. But really what we're trying to do is build uh, a fundamental technology. So those contracts are really there to fund our ability to build this 6G technology that I really want to want to build on. And, and that's, that's kind of the way that, that we've been running the company. So before we delve into 6G, yeah, let's talk about 5G. <laughs> the wireless industry promises right. it's going to be here as soon as next year. It's going to uh, bring a new wave of new applications that weren't available before, IoT, driverless cars talking to each other, boost speed and reliability. But I mean, where are we in the hype versus reality well, there, There's right a now. lot of hype. I mean, because it's not just bigger speeds and feeds. People are talking about ultra reliability and low latency. I mean, you saw that in the video. That stuff's not actually even really in the standards yet. That's going to come. That it won't be in 2019. That'll be 2020 and beyond that you get that ultra reliability and low latency that you need for some of these mission critical applications, healthcare or automotive or all, all these other kinds of things. So where, where are we today? I mean, in the US, well, right now, there's a spectrum auction going on right now for very high frequency bands. And some of the operators have already started to roll out what I'd call uh, fixed wireless access with it. So basically, the 5G system is not even really working as a mobile system. It's working as backhaul. It's connecting the, I don't know, your computer that you want to run at high speed in your house or that you want to get video to in your house. It's connecting it back up to the network. Now, China's getting ready to roll out also. They are not rolling out right now at the very high frequencies. They're actually rolling out at a lower frequency than they are uh, mostly in the United States. And so they'll actually will have longer distances that their system can cover. And then what they get out of 5G is it's wider bandwidths. That means that you get more data throughput. Uh, and so that helps them out a lot. That, that allows them to roll their system out. And then eventually, people will now go on and, and build the other capabilities in this 
high reliability, and low latency. But that, that hasn't happened yet. And the downside of the, the new systems is that they're going to make the handsets cost a little bit more. So when you go to a wider bandwidth, that means the chip inside has to be higher performance. It's just costs a little bit more. And when you go to higher frequencies, a similar kind of thing happens. You have to put in more mm -hmm. radio components. So some of these things are going to slow the pace of the, you know, the really high-speed mobile applications. And what exactly is going to be possible that isn't currently? And from a consumer perspective, what more will they get beyond just faster? Right now, better? they're just going to get faster. Mm -hmm. Soon, they'll get things like low latency, which is important for things like uh, augmented and virtual reality. Mm -hmm. So if I want to see something at very high uh, quality, I can't actually do the computation on the device, on the headset. You know, now you have big wires going to your computer. So this will actually allow it to be done wirelessly. And we're working with some, uh, some customers on that. In fact, I'm part of the Sacramento Kings. They just did a thing with Verizon doing, watching mm. a game with AR and VR. And they used Wi-Fi as the, and 5G uh, uh, to, to Wi-Fi. So it's those kinds of things. You can get AR. And, at, and VR at very high qualities because what will happen is you'll actually have a, a, a server right close to you. And when I look and then I'm turning my head, I send the information where my head's pointing to the server. It does the computation because it can do a lot more than I can do on the device. Sends me back something very high quality. And now my head's moved just a little bit more, so I have to adapt it. And that's what the device is. The device mm -hmm. is just adapting for that last little bit, which is why low latency is super important. Right. But we have a really interesting uh, industrial customer. So industrial IoT is a really interesting thing for this, too. And it's a company called Brain Corporation, which SoftBank put a lot of money into. And they build floor cleaning robots for places like Walmarts and things like that. And they, have, they basically take these existing floor cleaning machines that people sit on and drive around, and they replace the person with uh, a brain, a, an AI system with different sensors on it and so forth. The problem is that each one of those devices has an expensive brain on it. And what they really want to do is take the brain, offload it into the network, and then they can run multiple devices off the same hardware. So it's much cheaper for each device. And, and also, there's still a little computation locally so that if it has to make some quick avoidance, it does that. But for the most part, the big computations moved off. And in addition, they also wanted us to help them make their system, because they're in warehouses with big you know, metal roofs and stuff. They're, their communications wasn't so good. So they wanted us to give them high reliability, and they wanted to move the brain out of the cleaning machine hmm. into the edge of the network. And so we're doing that kind of stuff and as well. And in terms of VR and AR, you know, I've tried on a lot of the devices, right. HoloLens, HTC, et cetera. Does, are you working with those types of consumer uh, devices to get the cables smaller, get it mobile, as you so mentioned? So we, we want to get rid of the cables altogether. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, from the Qualcomm days, and now we know sort of everybody that's in the market building those kinds of things. And I, and I would agree. I mean, it, hasn't, it is not a consumer, like you don't have this in your home right mm -hmm. now. So our idea is that it's going to start out in, say, theaters, where you build up a stage. And when you walk around, you touch things. And the things are actually there. We're working with a company called The Void that does that kind of stuff. Now, their problem is right now, when you walk around, you have a big backpack on your back with a big computer on it. And when they want to do something for little kids, well, a kid can't carry that around. It's really not that comfortable even for an adult. So we want to get rid of all of that. We want to get very, very high quality there, all done wirelessly. You walk around, and all you have are the goggles on, and everything else is being done mm -hmm. in a computer that's close by, so in the edge of the network, not in the deep cloud. And XCOM only has about 20 people right now, right? It's a startup. Yes, exactly. What specifically can this company achieve that you couldn't at Qualcomm with all of its resources and engineering expertise? Well, I mean, there's things that Qualcomm can do. It's a big company. It, it was having a hard time to focus in on some of the leading edge applications because they're a lot smaller. I mean, it's a big company, needs big customers, lots, you know, billion chipsets almost a year, that kind of thing. So we're able to actually focus in on the leading edge customers, drive the whole end-to-end -end system. Qualcomm's becoming increasingly just focused on building the componentry. They've actually de-emphasized the development of new technologies. So that's the reason why I've been able to get a number of the really good system engineers, because they're not seeing that they're able to do that kind of deep innovation. I mean, the wireless industry in general has disinvested from the, the fundamental technology innovation. Really, it's Huawei and Samsung are the key leaders at this point. And Xcom now is trying to also do that. We're small. 
I get it, but you know, we have partners as well. And so we'll work with partners closely to bring these innovations to market. And speaking of deep innovations, that was one of your primary theses behind taking Qualcomm private to allow it to really focus on these long-term bets. So I have to ask you, are you still working on that? So I don't have any updates now. I mean, basically, uh, we continue to watch what the company is doing. I mean, obviously, there have been not great developments on the legal side for them. The stock price is down. The market cap's like half of what it was when I was there. So we, we're watching it. My, my, one of my favorite sayings is, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. So we're prepared. We watch. And in the meantime, you know, as there's resources that are leaving, and there are great resources, and we want to retain a critical mass, we're able to hire those people. How would XCOM fit into a potential take private, theoretically? Oh, I mean, it could have could have gone back in and been the corporate R&D department. It could have been you know, some leading edge application. So there's lots of ways that XCOM could work in, in, a, in a take private. Well, when you first discussed it, it was sort of largely dismissed by analysts and observers. And now there have been a lot of market fluctuations, as you said. And even at around $55 a share, it's still a 65 to $70 billion company. Mm -hmm. How exactly would it work? Okay, so uh, you know, it's there's debt and equity, and there's you, know, you have to go put together the whole thing. But the question at this point now is, if you look at the EBITDA of the company, it's come down. If you look at their financial results, there were a number of one-time events. There have been stock buybacks make the EPS go up, but if, but debt is based off of EBITDA, so now that's come down as well. So the market cap comes down, but there's cash now off the balance sheet. There's all these different things that have gone on with with the company. So. Um, like I said, no updates. I don't want to give any updates. We're watching the company. Uh, we're, we're prepared if, there, if an opportunity arises. And Our chances I'll high? I'll leave it there. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to get to 6G, because you talked a lot about how you're focused from 4G to 6G. What exactly is 6G? I'm not telling you what exactly is 6G, because that's what we're working on. But, uh, <laughs> what do you think it may be, without giving away well, too I much? I know what I want it to be. So. Uh, so basically, it's just it's the idea that we will improve all of these things that we talked about. We will make them work better. So in 5G, it's the first time people are trying to make things more reliable. It's the first time people are trying to get lower latency built into the system and for these applications. And there's some other feature that we want to add to the system as well. And we will we know how to make this work. Um, and we're, we'll actually have some beginnings of some products within the next year that will start us down that path. And you played a big role in that transition from 3G to 4G when you were at Qualcomm. Uh, how does hype versus reality from that transition, what can that tell us about the transition to, from 4G to 5G? I mean, the hype is, you know, it always happens at every G transition. What really, the big thing that happened was we built the, the basic capabilities for the wireless internet. And then we had built the basic capabilities so that smartphones could happen. And then it took a little while, because these things always do. It's like every technology innovation that kind of goes like that, and then it goes like that. And that's what happened with the smartphone. And, and while we're sitting here, we look at these 5G capabilities coming out, edge computing, internet of things, all the things you saw in the video. Those things take their time. And then all of a sudden, you say, oh my god, it was an overnight success. No, actually, we've been working on that for eight years. And we had to go convince people to build out the networks and all these other things. So it's, I think it's a very similar kind of situation. I actually feel like we are sitting as an industry right ahead of this set of revolutions, mostly focused around uh, IoT from the device side. And then from the network side, it's network virtualization, all these buzzwords that are going on, which means basically you run the network on kind of standard hardware. And then you spread that network all the way out into the field. So you push it closer and closer to the edge of the network and closer to the devices, which I've probably gotten too technical now. So. <laughs> well, some recent reports have concluded that the US is actually behind China and South Korea in terms of building 5G networks, and that this could be detrimental to the US economy if they don't catch up. I mean, what's your view on that? And which country is really ahead and ready to set the standards for this? Uh, the standards are mostly done already. That's why we're focused on 6G instead of 5G. I mean, there are things to do in 5G, and we are doing that. Uh, mainly around these ultra-reliable and low-latency things. Um, China is very focused on rolling out. They were very late to 3G. They were a little you know, on 4G. They want to be ahead on, on 5G. So you know, the estimates are there's massive, massive investment that's going to go there. What we see right now is that they're going mostly in a lower band, so they get 
more distance for the amount of you know, uh, cell sites that, that they put in. But the United States is going very hard, and it's a big marketing war between all the operators to say that they have 5G. Now, what we see right now is fixed wireless access as being the main application of 5G, so backhaul for your computer, like we were talking mm. about uh, earlier. And, and so um, getting to fully mobile 5G, that's where it will be interesting, and that's going to be all about who can bear the cost of putting in the extra component tree that goes in there. Do they have the right applications for it? The kinds of applications that we see on the consumer side are a little slower, but we are trying to accelerate those things. The kind of applications we see on the industrial side, like this brain example that I gave, those kinds of things are definitely there right now. People are looking at other robotics things, drones, other you know, uh, industrial automation kind of things, auto obviously automotive and assisted driving and those kinds of things. But some of these things, they are a little farther out there. Mm. And so I think right now we're going to see a lot of this kind of fixed wireless access. We'll mm. see the beginnings of the first handsets coming out in 2019. But it's, you know, 2020 is really the time. And, and it's, it is the countries that you named. I mean, it's, well, for sure in Japan. I mean, they're, they're definitely going to have the 2020 Olympics. It's going to be a 5G Olympics. Just like in Korea, they started to have things in 2018 Winter Olympics. So. For some reason, wireless industry does things around the Olympics. I'm not exactly sure why. <laughs> and uh, speaking of China, one of the main concerns in terms of uh, not allowing Broadcom to take over Qualcomm was that Cepheus was worried about China being the dominant player in 5G, and that would have national security ramifications. I mean, do you buy that? Do I buy that Huawei? <laughs> that there are national security concerns if China is the dominant player in 5G. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of choices right now. I think the issue would be whether there was no choice and therefore you were forced to only buy from a certain manufacturer. And if people believe that, that there were national security concerns around that particular supplier, OK, I, I get that. I, mean, I don't know. I'm not in the middle of those, those kinds of things. Um, I, you know, when it came to Broadcom, I mean, that was completely unexpected. I didn't expect it. I had no. I thought the probability that something like that would happen was, was quite low. I thought that what would happen would be they would just delay it until Broadcom was able to redomicile. And then, obviously, that was a piece of it. And then the investor base was pretty upset because the board had said that they weren't going to delay the shareholder meeting, and Cepheus then delayed it. And then Donald Trump comes in. The president comes in and says, no, this is so important. I'm going to block this, and not just block it at the time, but really on an ongoing basis. That was quite quite unexpected, I would say. And so it's a little hard to tell. I mean, the United States hasn't really had industrial policy per se, right? So now I guess we sort of do in a certain way.